Greetings to all of you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we've been uh, on this series called Fine Linen Series, Fine Linen Sermon Series. Uh, and the Lord has been doing a work of purification in us and praise God for those of you who are responding to it and receiving the word. Amen. And uh, last uh, month or so we've been looking at uh, in the area of worship. Say worship. Man. There is a, there's a joy in being able to worship Jesus. Man, it's a privilege. Say privilege. It's your privilege to worship Jesus. Man, it's your privilege to worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So we, we were looking at the, the three-pronged fork. Yes? And we were looking at the three-pronged fork. Uh, we saw it in the book of S. Samuel, considering the the account of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the prophet. Uh, and we were looking at the context. We were looking at uh, the context of worship. And the Lord has been speaking to us. And we saw it in First Samuel chapter 2 onwards, how Eli's, Eli the priest, he had two sons by the name. That's good, Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, we see that they used a certain kind of fork to thrust into the sacrifice meat in the boiling pot or the kettle or the cauldron, uh, even before it was burned before the Lord. What the Lord has allotted the, the Levites is to take from that which is sacrificed, a certain section of that uh, sacrifice belonged to the priest. It belonged to them after it has been burnt uh, in the, in the, on the, upon the altar. But these two, Hophni and Phinehas, would use force and those who come to Shiloh to worship the Lord and offer sacrifices, the two of these priests, sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they used to thrust this three-pronged fork into the boiling pot and whatever comes out of the pot, they will take it. And they will demand that the meat is offered to them before it is burned before the Lord. The Bible says they were not used to the customs of the Lord. You can grow up in the house of God and not be used to the customs of the Lord. You can grow up in church and not be familiar with the customs of the Lord. And the Bible says they did not know the Lord. Can you believe the sons of the priest? You can be a, a son of a missionary. You can be a son of a pastor, an evangelist. You can be a son of strong believers or a daughter in, in a family of believing parents. But you can grow up without knowing the Lord. There's a danger. That's why we, we talked about it last week. We said it's important. How important it is for us as parents to pray for our children. That they will have a real encounter with the Lord. So that their relationship with, with the Lord will not be routed through anybody else. It's not based on the father's account or the mother's account, but they have tasted for themselves. And we must pray that for our children. Constantly challenge them, push them, shake them. We can raise them up, we can train them in the ways of God. At the end of the day, they have to choose for themselves. But the promise is if we train them up, they shall, they shall not depart from it, even when they are old. The importance of training up children in the Lord. So Eli failed to do it clearly because his two sons, they did not, they grew up in the same house. They saw, they witnessed Eli offering sacrifices. But these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, had nothing to do with the Lord. They knew no customs. Because by way of Levitical lineage, they became priests themselves. But they would not know how to handle the sacrifices. All they were concerned was, what can we get out of this? If your concern is what you can get out of you serving God, you are not having the right mindset. Man, your heart is far from God. So the Bible says that these two, they both despised the sacrifice unto God. Say despised. Strong word. The Bible says that these two despised sacrifices made unto who? Made unto God. The Bible says that they kicked at the sacrifices. Can you think about that? Kicking at the sacrifice offered unto God, the living God, the one true living God. 
the sacrifices that were brought to him they despised it so much that god deemed it as being kicked by them but in stark contrast in the same context or in the in the same same time frame we see the wholesome offering of hannah say hannah say wholesome what she offered unto the lord her firstborn son in order to keep a lifetime nazarite vow she made which she made before he was born even before she conceived by the way she made that vow before god even before she conceived when she was yet barren and just to keep that vow that she made in worship unto god she brought to god this wholesome offering her, her first born son she weaned up weaned the child made sure that the child is ready to be presented before god hello think about it the effort this mother would have taken yeah she took the pain she she had sleepless nights she took the pain she fed the child she nursed the child cleaned up the child and did all that weaned the child and then when she was satisfied to the point that okay now i can present samuel before the lord she brought him to the house not that she can take him back often but that he can remain before the lord all the days of his life and she would come to the same place every year year after year to to sacrifice unto god and she would come with a robe every year she'll come and gift him with a robe hallelujah can you can you just picture this in your mind amen are you with me so go the extra mile to make sure that your offering before god is ready you mean that that to make sure that your offering before god is wholesome take pains take the effort so we considered how the many types of three pronged fork are still in in use are still seen at the altars of worship in our churches today in our families today hello do you know that they are still being in, in use they are still being used we can see it on the on the altars near the altars of worship we can see it in the form of attitudes say attitudes we can see it in the form of approaches we can see it in the form of systems in place we can see it in the form of practices we can see it in the form of traditions being put into place we can see it in the form of technology we can see it in in varied forms this three pronged fork which is thrust into that which is sacrificed unto god even in the modern day church culture and we as the church must be mindful we must be mindful and we must be careful and we must get rid of every three pronged fork in our worship we must not have any of such three pronged forks when we come before him whether it be our attitude whether it be our mindset whether it be an approach whether it be a tradition or a custom that we follow whether it be some technology that we are using if we are if that is being thrust that is being um you know used to kick at the sacrifice of god if that stands in the way of people worshiping jesus if that stands in the way of people being able to behold the beauty of the lord then we must get rid of such forks now when you read the account you'll be blown away by how god perceives our worship the bible in fact the bible when you read through the bible we will see that god is always watchful he's watchful of our worship he looks at our worship not just in the in the old testament we see that in the new testament also the offering that that was made by the widow the two copper coins jesus was watching he was paying attention to the, the people who are coming to the off the, to the treasury and and putting their offering into the box whether you like it or not god is watching your worship you must be so god conscious when you are in the presence of god but we are man conscious when they are when in the presence of god we will do only the things which are right in the eyes of man the things which are pleasing to man anything that will displease man anything that will disturb the uh, the thought process of a man we will not do whereas we must be mindful of god we must be conscious of him and his eyes upon us when we stand in worship and when i say 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 worship you know 
first of all we have to start with our act of worship but you must also understand it 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 uh, uh, spreads across everything that you do in life whether you eat or drink do it all for the glory of god or whatever you do any any work that you do anything that you do in life is an act of worship it can be an act of worship you must be so god conscious even concerning our work what does the bible say the bible says know that you are serving the lord the lord christ don't do do your work as a lip service unto man don't do it as a as an eye service unto man to please man know that you are serving the lord christ hallelujah let's read from first samuel chapter 2 verse 27 onwards now just to see how god perceives the worship and the worshipper you will be amazed how god sees how god looks how god evaluates we have this wrong understanding that god is not bothered about any of these things we have we carry this wrong notion that god is not mindful god is not watching god is not looking at these things but you will be surprised when you read across the word when you read through the bible you study the word of god you will be surprised that the lord is very much involved in your act of worship his eyes are on you that's why the 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 psalm is full of um expressions of worship exuberance in worship why why is that so those who wrote those psalms those songs of worship they were well aware of the fact that god is interested in our worship our expressions say expressions so look at this first samuel chapter 2 and verse 27 onwards then a man of god came to eli and said to him thus says the lord did i not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in egypt in bondage to pharaoh's house first question man of god came and first question prophetically asking the first question did i not reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in egypt in bondage to pharaoh's house did i not choose them from all the tribes of israel to be my priest to go up to my altar to burn incense to carry an ephod before me and did i not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of israel so look at the question that he is first asked question did I, did i not reveal myself to the house of your father when you were at when they were still in egypt in bondage then second question did i not choose them from all the tribes of israel to be my priest to go up to my altar to burn incense to carry an ephod before me third question did i not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of israel then he keeps asking the question why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering which i have commanded in my dwelling and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choices of every offering of my people israel Therefore the the Lord God of Israel declares I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever but now the Lord declares far be it from me for those who honor me I will honor and those who despise me will be lightly say lightly esteemed lightly esteemed and God is asking questions you know with reference to the to the levitical um lineage yeah to aaron and then the same question applies to you as well did i not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father while in egypt in bondage if it is translated to your situation it it reads like this it goes like this did i not reveal myself to you while you were still enslaved in sin didn't god reveal himself to you did he did he do that did christ reveal himself to you when you are yet dead in your sins now every time you walk into the presence of god in worship you want to offer worship unto him you must always remember that you've been brought out of sin you've been brought out of egypt you've been brought out of bondage you had chains all over you nobody liked you you are a slave to sin but the question remains to you did i not reveal myself to you while you are yet enslaved to your sins 
referring to, referring to the gift of salvation. Say gift of salvation. We all have received the, the free gift of salvation. It's not by your merit that you got saved. It's because God revealed himself to you in Christ Jesus. It's not because you searched high and low that you found Christ. It's because he chose to reveal himself to you. You sought him and he allowed you to find him. You sought for the truth and when you sought for the truth, he allowed you to find him. No man can. 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 Did not choose them from all the rest to go up. All the rest of the, the tribes of Israel. Did I not choose your father's house to go up, to burn incense, to carry an effort before me? Translated to your context. Did I not handpick you to serve me from among the people? God has handpicked you. Do you know that? God has handpicked you. Today you think that you get to do things in the kingdom, in the church because you're so smart, because you're so able, because of your uh, greatness, because of your track record, because you, you've proved yourself. The truth is God handpicked you. You had nothing to do in the process. You have nothing to do in that process. I had nothing to do in the process of me becoming who I am today and being able to serve him. I had no choice at all. No choice at all. I just responded when he called, follow me. That's all. The honor of serving him. Consider the gift of salvation. Consider the honor of serving him. Third question. Did I not give to the house of your father all of the fire offerings of the people? Translated to your situation. Did I not allot to you an inexhaustible portion? The good inheritance. When you came to Christ, you have received a good inheritance. An inexhaustible portion of his goodness. Amen. God's provision, which is far above the riches of this world. And some of you, you have to take stock of all that. Now some of you think that the, the way your life is running is only because you've been working so hard. I want you to know that God has his eyes on you. Amen. The eyes of every living creature looks to him and he gives them food in due season. You are no different. It's the goodness of God that feeds you. It's the goodness of God that puts food on your table. It's the goodness of God that your children are looking the way they look. It's the goodness of God that is, that, that is causing you to be clothed. Next question, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering? Translated, why do you despise my worship? Talks about, it's about your selfish motives. God is putting the focus on your selfish motives. Some of you give me that look, I don't have any. But the Lord sees. Your divided heart, when you stand before God, your divided, God is referring to that. Why do you kick at my sacrifice? Why, you, why do you stand before me with a divided heart? Why do you have your selfish motives? Your agenda. Why do you pamper your agenda when you're serving me? The next question is, is so, so on the face. Why do you honor your sons above me? Translated into your context, why do you place anything or anyone above me? Why do you have people more dearer than me in your life? Meaning, he's talking about corrupted priorities. Your priorities have been corrupted. When it comes to honoring God, your priorities have been cor corrupted. The culture of honor has been so corrupted. You give honor to man, but you can't give honor to God. So when you stand in worship, these are the things that you, that, that you must take account of. The gift of salvation. The honor of serving him. 
the good inheritance in Christ Jesus. Your motives and your heart, whether they are selfish or divided, and your priorities, whether it is corrupted or not. God is referring to all that in these four or five questions that he asked. The man of God came to Eli and verbalized these questions on the face. Today God is asking you that question. And verse 30 says, For those who honor me, I will. All of you together. For those who honor me. For those who honor me. For those who honor me. And those who despise me. The church must take this very seriously. Take it very seriously. We cannot overlook these principles in God's word. This is the word of God which remains forever. It remains forever. And he says, those who honor me, I shall honor. Those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Don't think that is only for the Old Testament. Don't think that only apply to Eli and, Eli and his two sons. No. It applies to you and I. It applies to the church today. It applies to all generations. Because it is God's word. It stands forever. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So where do you stand? Do you stand in honor unto God or you, you stand in despising God and his sacrifice? The account we have been looking at shows the contrast in worship. I love the contrast here. This is a con say contrast. The contrast here is so, it's, it's remarkable. This contrast is so, it's a stark contrast. And do not think that all worship is alike unto God. We tend to think that all worship is the same. It's all the same for God. It's not the same for God. Now we might have, we might have ecumenical mindset. We might have, what do you call that thing? Harmony, world harmony and brotherhood and all that. But I want you to know that for God, there is, there is a worship that pleases Him and there is a worship that does not please Him. All worship is not alike unto God. Not everything done in the pretext of worship is true worship. Hello. Not everything done in the pretext of worship is true worship. Even in the church. Even in the church. That's why it is important for God's people to know what is true worship. Because you've been called to be true worshippers. Just because somebody endorsed a form of worship or somebody endorsed a type of worship does not mean that it is worship unto God. God is not looking for types of worship. He's looking for true worship. Yes. He's not looking for variety in worship. He's looking for true worship. Yes. And we try to bring in the, in, the, the, in the variety. We try to bring in the flavors. You don't have to try and do anything. You can just be yourself in worship. But your heart must be offered unto God. Yes. Man. Look, look, the Lord had, had, a, he had a clear, he made a clear distinction between Abel's sacrifice and Cain's sacrifice. We must get used to that. There's a clear distinction between the worship of Abel and the worship of Cain. And I want you to know that today, get ready. are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Today in church, some of you worship like Abel and some of you worship like Cain. The two brothers raised by the same parents, living in the same house, under the same roof, given the same set of instructions, can you, can you think about it? They had nobody else to influence them also. All by themselves. Had the same kind of influence available to them. One chose to give an offering which pleased God. The other one chose to give an offering that despised God. So today in church, some of you worship like Abel. And some of you worship like Cain. Some of you worship like the sinner woman with the alabaster vial. While some of you worship like Simon the leper. Some of you worship like the widow who put the two mites, two copper coins, all that she had, out of the little that she had, all that she had. And some of you are like the rich people who had an abundance but gave a small little portion out of that abundance. Some of you worship like Hannah and some of you worship like Hophni, Ophinus. That's where it is. That's the truth. Now you, can, you, can, you cannot hide from this. You cannot hide from this. 
just because you come to church does not mean that you are automatically a Hannah. It does not mean that you're automatically the, the widow with the two mites. It does not mean that you're automatically the, the sinner woman who gave the alabaster vial of perfume. You understand? There is a chance, there's a possibility that your heart is not right with God and that your heart is far from God and you've allowed, you've forgotten the gift of salvation. You've forgotten the priorities in life. And you have your selfish motives coming into play. You have a divided heart. And there is no honor. You feel no honor in serving him. It's become a, it's become a job. It's become a, just a routine. A mechanical process. But you don't feel the honor. You, can't, you don't remember that you've been handpicked by God. Not because of who you are. But because of who he is. You know why these things are recorded in the word? Huh? So that, so that you and I don't have to struggle to understand the likes and dislikes of God. God's word is given to us. God's word makes it very plain. God's word teaches us the likes and dislikes of God. Of God. Amen? God's word reveals his likes and his dislikes so that we don't have to speculate or do guesswork. Some of us are doing that. We are speculating. We, we are looking at the trends. What is the trend? Maybe God is like that. God is not like anybody else. God does not think like a man. He is not a man. You are guessing your speculation about how he likes something or how he dislikes something is out of, it's completely, out, it should be out of the way. Look into God's word. So when you, when you study these accounts, take it up very seriously. When you study about Hannah, when you, when you read about Hophni and Phinehas, when you read about Cain and Abel, when you read about the sinner woman who came with the alabaster vial into the house of Simon the leper, when you read about the widow who put the two mites, two copper coins in the treasury box, learn something about the likes and dislikes of God. God wants to teach you to how to worship him. God wants to reveal his likes and dislikes to you. The only way it is revealed is through his word. Say word. So you have to, every time you, you come across a scripture, every time you're meditating on scriptures like this, you must check, where, I, where do I stand? Do I stand like Hannah? Or is there some Phinehas in me, some Hophni in me? Is my offering looking like Abel's offering? Or does it look like Cain's offering? Where do I stand? The two contrasting approaches in worship, one that of Hannah with a wholesome offering and one that of Hophni and Phinehas with their three-pronged fork, know that one is the way that pleases God and the other is the way that displeases God. Are you able to make sense of this? It's not just a story that you learned in Sunday school, by the way. Hello. For some of you, I have learned about Hannah. I remember Hannah, Sunday school story. Do you know that it applies to you today? When you stand before God in worship, this applies. The truth of this word applies to you. It helps you to worship the way he wants you to worship. And I just strongly feel that the Lord is waiting to hear vows made in deep worship unto God. From this church, from you, he's waiting. Hannah kept going to the same place over and over, did the same kind of worship, the same offering. That she followed the patterns, she followed the trends, she followed what was stipulated, she followed what her husband encouraged her to do. But one fine day she realized that this is not enough. There is so much more to worship than this. So even, before, even without checking with, with uh, Elkanah, even without consulting with any man, she stood before God. She poured out her heart unto God in prayer, in deep worship, and made the vow that I'm going to offer my son. Even before she conceived, even before she had relationships with Elkanah anymore. 
That is worship. Say worship. Say worship. God is assuring us there is great reward in selfless, wholesome worship. The Lord is speaking to somebody here. There is great reward. Say great reward. There is a great reward in selfless worship. There is a great reward in wholesome worship. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You must not miss it. There's a great reward when you offer unto God your wholesome worship. If you're the type that, that goes to the same, comes to the same place and does the same thing and there is no change in the way you worship, there is no heart in it, it's become a very it's a monotonous, routine, uh, mundane process for you, then there's something is wrong. You're not going to enjoy the blessings of wholesome worship. You're not going to enjoy the blessings of selfless worship. You have to go beyond the norms. You have to go beyond the, the usual. Huh? You, have to, you have to be ready. You have to come prepared with the alabaster vial. That is just precious to you. You have to come prepared to break it at the feet of Jesus. You have to let go of your, your pride. You have to let go of your dignity. What would people think? And let go of that. Drop it. Your sophistication, drop it to the ground. Discard it. It will not fetch you any good. Then why are you carrying it? But your selfless worship before God, it will bless you. It will change your situation. It will take away the label of shame. It will break the reproach of barrenness over your life. When you study 1 Samuel and see two contrasting kinds of worship, you must remember these things. You must remember these things. And I, and I just can't wait to see the, the weight of his goodness that's going to come upon you. Even as you respond to this word. And I'm waiting to see that. I know it's going to happen. Those of you who are responding to this word, you're, you're making corrections in your life. You're making corrections in the way you worship. You're making corrections in your approach to God. And I want to give you a word. You can write it down if you want. God's weight of goodness is going to come upon you. It's going to change your situation. It's going to change everything about you. No man will be able to stand in the way. No man will be able to deny it from you. Take it away from you. He says waiting. He, God is waiting. Jesus is waiting. He is waiting for that alabaster box. He is waiting for you to come with this alabaster box. He is waiting to hear some vows in your worship. I know that there is a breakthrough in this word. So I just want to encourage you. Respond to this word. Respond to this word. And just like the label that the, the woman bore for so many, I don't know how long she bore that label. In that city she was known as a sinner. But when she chose to bring before Jesus the alabaster box, the alabaster vial of perfume. And when she chose to face the ridicule of man and the despising of man, she chose to bear that reproach. And she, she didn't care about anything. All, it, all that mattered to her was the presence of Jesus. I get my opportunity to worship at his feet and I'm going to give it unto him. So what happened? Just like that, the label over her came off. Jesus said, you are no longer a sinner. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven of your sins. So forgiven. God wants to do something like that in your life. Just like this, the label of shame that you carry. He wants to get rid of that. He wants you to get rid of that. He wants to take it off you. He wants to erase that name. He wants to break that curse over you. That reproach that you've been carrying. That you're barren, you're unfruitful. You're not good for anything. Just like that, one moment, one moment. There's one quote that I, I, I learned uh, a few years back. I believe it's by Mike Murdoch. I forgot who it was. Or Tommy Tenney. I forgot who it was by. It says, one moment of favor is better than a lifetime of labor. One moment of favor. And when you come to worship, when you come before him in worship, you're opening up your, your life you are, you are making room to receive the favor of God. And that one moment of favor from God is all that, it, all that matters to you. 
it is it it'll, it'll do much beyond than a lifetime of labor all your labor cannot achieve for you what you're seeking to achieve but that moment of favor with god can change everything about you that's what happened to hana she tried they waited every month she probably would have been waiting to hear the good report the good news nothing happened she went every year to offer sacrifices the same way she used to do it she kept hearing the reproach from her rival panina nothing changed but one fine day she she decided today i'm going to i'm going to break open i'm going to break open my my sophistication i'm going to go beyond they all wanted it was time for them to leave they all had stopped their customary proce- procedures of worship but she went back in the house opened her heart before god poured it out and made that vow and the man of god said what the petition that you made before god may it be granted to you she went out never being sad again never being sad again and god wants to transform your life like that he wants to transform your life like that he wants to bring about a a flip say flip a flip in your situation first samuel chapter 2 i i just want to know what's the the title given in your bible hana song of thanksgiving most of you will have that title hana's song of thanksgiving okay let's see what it, the bible says first samuel chapter 2 and verse 1 then hana what prayed. then hana prayed. then hana prayed and said but the title do you just read out to me was hana's but what did she did she sing this but the bible says then hana prayed, prayed and said hana prayed not hana sang I, like i said many of our bibles have hana song as the heading of this section and i want to know that headings are not part of the original text it's just the the viewpoint of the people who put it together but the actual te- text does not say that hana sang but that she she prayed she prayed hana is like that if you notice if you remember in the first chapter why did she go to shilo no to offer sacrifice to offer worship so what do you expect when you are standing in worship yes yeah, say say song you are modern day christians tell me what when when you hear worship what do you think of think of you think of the guitar the keyboard right tell me the truth you you think of music you think of bands and musicians So but when she went up to Shiloh to worship there was no band mentioned there there's no song going on all he sees she prayed she poured out her heart before God in prayer so when when we expect Hannah to do a song in prayer in, in worship we see her praying in worship and here when this is now in chapter 2 after she received a miracle and she brought to uh, Eli her first born son we expecting her to sing break forth into a, a song but here we see that a song is now not being sung but she's praying the song are you getting this hana is like that and you know, for for her you know see we must come to a place like that we must come to a place like hana where we can hardly distinguish between worship and prayer we must not be able to distinguish between prayer and worship it's it's one of the same when you stand in worship you are praying and when you are standing in prayer you are you are worshiping you are singing but you are praying the song today we have demarked in the church today we have demarked time of worship wednesday worship friday friday prayer sunday little prayer little worship So in our mind we for, for us it's all demarked in our mind there is no prayer in worship there is no worship in prayer but look at Hannah when she stood in worship she was praying and when she was in a song she was not singing the song she was praying the song 
And when you study God's word, you will see that nobody ever wrote a song for the sake of writing a song in the Bible. Hello. You will not see a single person in the Bible who wrote a song for the sake of writing a song. They were not after record labels or YouTube releases, nothing of that sort. The reason they came out with a song is because it, came, it was birthed out of their prayer. It was birthed out of their intimacy with God. That's why it is full of revelation. Today we are guilty of dividing and demarking our prayer and our worship. Our worship must become so full of prayer. Hello? Your worship must become so full of prayer. And your prayer must rise up before God like a song of praise. That you're not, you're not struggling. You're not struggling in prayer. You don't know what to pray. Look at this. She stood and she's praying. How she's praying. It's full of rhythm. It's, it's full of poetry. It's full of theme. Today we are struggling. If somebody, if, if, if I were to ask somebody to come and pray, you'll be like, okay, pastor. Because you don't know that prayer should rise up from you like a song. Don't divide. Every spiritual song in the Bible was birthed out of moments of prayer. Every, every song that we, that we see in the Psalms, it's all birthed out of people having a connection with God. It was not written for any record label, like I said. It was not written for any celebrity status. It was not written down for social media or anything of that sort. It was written for... But centuries later, we are still looking at those songs. We can hardly remember, remember songs which are released last year. But we can remember, we can, we can read these songs and, and, and find the deep things about God from the songs which are written centuries back. Timeless, say timeless. timeless. Hannah's song is a timeless, a timeless song, a timeless classic. Mary's song is a timeless classic. Moses' song, timeless classic. Deborah's song, timeless classics. It has, it has stood the test of time. It has stood the test of change of technology. It remains. Hallelujah. Every prayer which is offered in scripture was rhythmic and poetic because it was the way of life for the saints of old. Your prayer must be so rhythmic. I'm not, I'm not talking about rhythmic as in you know, next, next time don't feel pressured to be like rhythmic in prayer. What I meant is your prayer must be so ready. You must, your heart must be so full of prayer that you don't struggle in prayer. It's almost like the, those who read through this, this text, they can't make out whether she was singing or praying. The text says she was praying, but the, 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 way, it is, the way it has come forth, it looks like a song. So the heading has to be Hannah's song. But the, the first verse says, Hannah prayed and said. Are you, are you getting something here? Hallelujah. Praise God. May you be able to worship God in prayer. May you be able to pray in song. Hallelujah. May your worship be in prayer and your prayer be in a song. If that's the case, then every time you sing a song, you'll not be disconnected. When you sing a song like you're worthy of it all, you know that he is worthy of it all. Amen. When you sing a song like, I lift my hands up and lay my whole life down, you can't, you are, see some of, some of us sing like, you sing it in, in pitch, in harmony, in, in rhythm, in tempo, but your heart is far from it. You just said your whole life you want to lay down before God. Are you really willing to do that? You play through it, you sing through it, you, you probably repeat it also because the worship leader repeated it, the band repeated it. So you're all repeating, the, you're going through the whole process. But she prayed, my heart exults in the Lord and my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. You know, she prays. When you pray, acknowledge what God has done for you. That is prayer. You're pr when you are praying, it is not about going to God with a set of needs. 
Lord, heal me. Lord, give me money. Lord, give me a new job. Lord, give me a wife. Lord, give me this. If all you can think about in prayer is your needs and you fail to acknowledge what God has done in your life, that's not a prayer. But when Hannah prayed, she started by acknowledging what God has done. My heart exults. What does it mean to exult? What does the word exult mean? It means rejoice. It means to be jubilant. It means to celebrate. My heart celebrates. My heart is jubilant. Why? Because I am in the Lord. Today we, we, I, you know, we have to give counseling sessions after sessions to make people understand there is a reason to rejoice. But Hannah did not struggle. She started by saying, my heart rejoices. My heart exalts in the Lord. Because you are in Christ, you are in joy. You are so full of joy. Because he prayed, Jesus prayed. He prayed for your joy. Joy, that your joy may be made full. He said, ask of me that your joy may be made full. There is absolutely zero reason, say zero. Zero reason for a Christian to be sad. No reason. You cannot be sad. My heart exults in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. Okay, I'll just say it like this. If you're not able to find joy in your Christian life, it's your problem. It is not God's problem. The only reason a Christian can't rejoice is not, not, it's nothing to do with anybody else. It's nothing to do with people. It's not nothing to do with the church. It's nothing to do with the pastor. It's nothing to do with your parents or your house or anything like that. The only reason why a Christian can't find joy is because their heart is not in the Lord. Simple. If you are in the Lord, you will exult. Say exult. And you will rejoice. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My horn is exalted. See, the Bible says, I think it's in Psalm 70 or 75. It says, exaltation does not come from the east or from the west or from the desert. I like that, that, that detail. Not from the east or from the west or from the desert. And keeps it there. Hallelujah. Your exaltation come from the? My horn is exalted. Say, in the Lord. Don't seek exaltation in the east or in the west or in the desert where you'll only be scorched. I'll repeat that one more time. Don't look for your exaltation in the east. Is that east? Yeah, that's east, correct. East or west or in the desert where you, you will only be scorched under the strong sun. Your exaltation comes from the, the Lord. It comes from the Lord. And today's word is for those of you who are waiting on him for exaltation. In due time, he will exalt you. This word is for you. Only for you. Not for everyone. It's only for you. Amen. If you're just one person like that in this church, it's for you. God has sent me just for one person's sake, I believe. If that's so. Exaltation. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies. So boldness is from the Lord. Not from personality development programs. Boldness comes from the? The Lord can make you bold. You know, I've, I've run out of, I mean, I've, 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 I've lost count of the number of people I've met who have come to the Lord and have become bold. I've seen the change. Including me, by the way. Amen. When you come to the Lord, there's a boldness that comes about you. It comes over you. It makes you bold like a lion. Man, my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice. Now, who is my enemies? Now, Hannah is writing this song and you have all the reason to think because the Bible also says that her rival provoked her. So, by when she sings this song, when she says, my enemies, she is referring to Penina. But I wanted to know Prophetically, she is not referring to Penina here. Penina is far from her enemy. Penina is nothing. 
in comparison to Hannah. Hannah has favored. Hannah has graced. Penina cannot be an enemy to Hannah. When, when Hannah says, my enemies, she's referring to God's enemies. Everyone who stands against God, everyone who's got thoughts, lofty thoughts, raised up against the knowledge of God, they are my enemies. So she says, my heart exults in the Lord. I'm happy. I'm celebrating. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. My heart is exalted in the Lord. I'm not exalted because of man's um, work on me. Not because of man's provision, not because of anything like that. Not because of man's favor, because of God's favor. And he goes on to say, my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Say your salvation. Your salvation. Hallelujah. It means I've tasted of your power to save. I've tasted of your power to save. She's acknowledging the opening line of her prayer is full of acknowledging who God is. In fact, through this prayer, you'll, all, you'll, you'll, full, you'll see it all across this prayer. Your prayer must be so full of acknowledging who God is. You must acknowledge God in every line of your prayer. You must acknowledge the power of God in every prayer that you make. Prayer is about acknowledging who God is. You stopped acknowledging yourself and acknowledge God. That is prayer. You've been trying, 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 trying. Nothing is working. And finally say, God, you're able. Prayer. Amen. You've been trying, like you're going for that person for help, to this person for help. You're running after everybody that you know. Nobody's able to do anything in your life. And finally, you come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me because you're able to help me. Prayer. Amen. That is prayer. When you acknowledge God for who he is, that is prayer. You see that across this, this prayer made by Hannah. She's acknowledging God. Every line of this prayer, she's acknowledging God for who he is. He has done something. Verse 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. Say holy. holy. No one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Hallelujah. When you read this prayer, you must go like, I mean, the question that you must ask yourself, is God your only source? Is God your only source? Or is he just among the many for you? It says, there is none beside you. Is it true in your life? Or do you have so many support systems in your life? Is God one among the many support systems that you have in place? Or do you have others beside him to help, to deliver and to comfort you? The man is, I'm telling you. The, man, the, the corrupted heart of man. He will say one thing and do another thing. With his mouth, he will say a lot of, I trust in God and this and that. But he will be the most <laughs> faithless person that you can ever see. He will do all kinds of things that the world will do. Just to make sure that his life is safe. Because he can't find safety and security in the word of God. That's the beginning of his failure. When you can't find safety and security in God's word, that's the beginning of your fall. When you have so many like the Lord, see, she said, there's no one holy like the Lord. There is none, no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. When you find, what is holy? The, when you see the word holy, holy is a description that can be attributed only to God. So when she says, there is no one holy like the Lord, there is, it just means there is no one like God. There is no one who can replace God. If you have replacement to God, replacements to God, if you have substitutes to God, then you'll, you'll not be able to pray like this. Your prayer is faithless. In your prayer, when you say this, it must be true. I have no substitutes to you. You're the only one I have. There's no one besides you. You are, my, you are my only physician. You are my only doctor. You are my only provision. You are my only sustenance. You are my only protection. And it's like, you know, you put all the eggs in, the one, in one basket. That's not what the world teaches us. Don't put all your uh, eggs in the... Uh, eggs in one basket. Don't put uh, all your eggs in one basket. That's what the world teaches. But, you know, the word says, put all your eggs in... One basket. Faith in God. Everything. 
everything about your life your future your children your family your ministry your finances your provision your wealth everything that you need in life if you can put it all in the one basket that is trust in god then you can truly pray like hannah prayed there is no one holy like you there is no one beside you there is no rock like our god and that's where god wants us to be that he is your only source only trust he must become your only trust the only one that you trust verse 3 boast no more so very proudly do not let arrogance come out of your mouth for the lord is a god of knowledge and with him actions are weighed allow this i hope uh, by now you understand that hannah is not just trying to write a, a few few song a few, a few lines in a song but that she is declaring things prophetically this is prophecy in coming forth prophecy is uh, like they say forth telling speaking forth the glories of god that's what is happening here she is f- speaking forth the glories of god and she is speaking all this in accordance to god's heart and his will and in in doing that she is even speaking in opposition to the evil practices of the day like i said she is not just talking he is not talking about penina she is even talking about even unknowingly probably even unintentionally she is even pro- talking about the evil practices in the temple of god committed by the sons of eli she is not even probably not even thinking about it when she is doing it but she is doing it prophetically and she is saying boast no more so proudly do not let arrogance come out of your mouth for god is the god of knowledge god knows he knows what you're doing Amen. he knows everything about you in fact the next chapter reveals that god knows everything god knew everything about what these two were up to that they were trusting the three pronged fork that they were trying to get the meat before burning he even knew that they were they you know what he, they did the the worst thing that they could do was they laid with the women who were serving at the temple adultery in the temple in the house of god and the bible says god knew everything about them not just god even their father he said i am not hearing good report about you they call, he called the two sons eli called hophni and phinehas and said i am not what that which i am hearing about you is not good if you sin again if a man sins against man then god can moderate god can mediate but if a man sins against god who will come to the rescue he's asking all that all those questions to his sons but the bible says yet they did not repent does god not allow them to repent god did not allow god did not allow them to repent god wanted to put them to death the bible says the heart was the hearts were so hardened so full of themselves there is no space for repentance for the lord is a god of say knowledge he knows maybe your brother your sister your best friend your father your mother may not know the things that you do in secret in hiding but god is a god of and with him what are weighed actions are weighed he weighs actions god will weigh the actions of man i hope the new testament church understands these scriptures god is a god who weighs the actions of man he still does that and with him actions are weighed the, the god, for the lord is a god of knowledge and with him actions are weighed verse 4 the bows of the mighty are shattered but the feeble gird on strength what happens when the bows of the mighty are shattered what happens when the bows of the mighty are shattered they cease to become mighty all that they had to display their might was the bows that they carried when the bows are shattered what happens they are, they cease to become and but what happens on the other side but the feeble gird on strength if you are feeble the lord will clothe you with his strength Amen. this is, god is speaking to you very specifically this morning 
is a specific word coming to you prophetic word coming your way the god is assuring you that things are about to shift Amen. tables are about to turn Amen. the tide is about to change Amen. now we sang that song they say that the tide will never change they have not they have not seen what you can do there's power in your name Amen. I want to tell you, I want to prophesy over you. Things are about to shift. The tables are about to turn. The tide is about to change. God's favor is going to come upon those who love his word and those who submitted to him. True worshipers are going to experience the, the rich favor of God like never before. The weight of his goodness will come upon you. And no man can do anything about it. Amen. No man can do anything about it. Hallelujah. So things are about to shift. If this word is for you, say, Amen. Amen. Things are about to shift. Amen. Things are about to shift. Amen. Amen. Verse 5. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread. But those who were hungry cease to hunger. Look at the contrast here. Everything is about contrast. I would call it, if I were given the, the chance to, to compile the Bible and put headings, I like putting headings. I like giving titles. I would give it like this, the contrast in the eyes of God. Something like that. It'll be about the contrast. Look at this. It's all about contrast. It's about the contrast between Hannah's worship and the sons of Eli's worship. It's about how contrasting things are going to happen. Those who are full will hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry will cease to hunger. Things are about to change. The full will hire themselves out to for bread. And the hungry will no longer be. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm, I've been hungry for a while. But the Lord is giving me this word that I'm not, I'm not going, I'm come to, I'm going to come to a place where I will no longer be. I will cease to hunger. Because God is in control. Amen. This, 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 this is about God is in control. This, this prayer reveals that God is in control. Amen. Even the barren gives birth to. But she who has many children languishes. When God is in control, impossible things will come to pass. Now if, if the barren gave birth to one child, everyone will say, that's fluke. It, I mean, happenstance, it can happen. Coincidence, it just happened. But if a barren woman gives birth to seven children, nobody will utter a word about, people will not even, will not even remember that she was once barren. They will not even remember. That's why the Bible talks about, you will remember your reproach no more. You will, you will not remember the shame of your widowhood. That's the work that God wants to do in your life. When barren woman gives birth to seven children, it's only the result of God doing something. It's the result of God's perfect healing. The, the number seven denotes perfection. When God delivers, when God heals, it's a work of perfection. When if God were to heal you, it's a healing of perfection. It will stay. It's a complete healing. Confess it. Now, some of us, like, we are excited when some word of healing comes our way. We confess it for a season and then we stop. No, don't, don't stop. Keep confessing it because if God heals, it is perfect healing. The barren will give birth to seven. Now, here is a barren who gave birth to three. The, the doctor report was, no, she will not bear. She will not conceive. She gave birth to three. With not, not with man's assistance, not with medication. God's hand. Say God's hand. Man, God wants to do something like that in your life. Where no man can take, no man can take credit for what God is going to do in your life. No man. Say no man. Amen. You see, you must be resolved in your mind. What God is going to do in my life, I don't want anybody. I don't want anybody to take any credit for what God is going to do in my life. And declare it with your mouth. If God is going to exalt me, that's going to be for the glory of God. Not for the glory of man. I have a, I have a father in God. Not Godfathers. I have my father. He is my God. He is going to exalt me. No one can reverse it. No one. No one can reverse it. God will do a work in your life 
which cannot be attributed to chance, which cannot be attributed to coincidence, which cannot be attributed to the work of man. He will do such a thing where he alone will get the glory. He alone will get the glory. And I'm waiting for that. I've seen it in my life. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm waiting for more. Amen. I'm, I'm going to yet see that in my life. Where no one else will take any credit for what he's going to do in my life. Verse 6. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He, he also exalts. That's that word again. Say exalts. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he set the world on them. The world, if the world is resting on the foundation that God has laid, do you think that these things are difficult for God? That he will raise the poor from the dust? He will make, he will, he will lift the needy from the ash heap and he will make them sit with nobles and he'll give them a, a seat of honor. When God performs a miracle in your life, no man will be able to boast about it. No man will be able to boast about it. That's how God works. He will not share. The Bible says he will not share his glory with anyone. You know, you are desperately trying, some of you are desperately trying to find that breakthrough, to get that big break in your life. And if you get that also, it will not give any glory to God and it will not stay long in your life. It will crumble to the ground. But if God were to exalt you, no man can reverse it and the glory will belong to God and God alone. And you have to decide. That's your worship. I don't need man's help. I don't, mean, I don't need any man to boast that he helped me. then you will become a God pleaser and not a man pleaser. Amen. Amen. Today we are, we are pleasing everybody. You want to please, you know, you are in ministry, you want to please everybody who comes to church. You want to play according to their tune. You want to preach according to their liking, their, uh, you know, their... No. No. That is not going to happen. It's for God. You've been called to do something for God. It is for God, not for man. Don't please man. Man will say something today, he will forget it tomorrow. But God says something, he will not forget it. His word remains forever. If he, if he says something and you believe it, it shall be done. It shall be done. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in man. Some I trust in, some I trust in chariots. But we shall remember, say remember, remember the name of our God, our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. When God works, the pride of man will be brought low. Now you must pray like that. Lord, when you, when you work in my life, let the pride of man be brought low. God's work will expose the emptiness of, of man's pride. God's work in your life will expose the emptiness of man's pride. God's work in your life will, will deflate the pomp of man. It will deflate it. Everyone who's, who is acting high and mighty, their pomp will be deflated in seconds. I'm telling you in seconds. In the matter of a split second, when God is about to do something, He can change situations like this. The Hannah who was a reproach, the Hannah who was, a, uh, who was called a barren woman, the sinner woman in the city, she was known as a sinner all over that city. In a split second, everything changed. Jesus said, I came for you. You are forgiven. The next thing that you know about Hannah is she's coming with a child. She offered that child and she goes back, bears another six. That's what God can do in your life. Nobody can. Nobody can. The husband who said, it's okay, let's give up. But am I not better than 10 sons? Hannah said, no. I don't want you to be better than 10 sons. I just want you to be my husband. God is able to give me sons and daughters. Even Elkanah could not take credit for what God did. Even Elkanah could not take glory for what God did in 
Hannah's life. And God wants to unlock some things in your life. Lock up. She was praying over this land and she said, let every, uh, every space for unrighteousness and wickedness be locked up. But the gospel, let the space for gospel be opened up in your life also. May God's word, the, the glory for God's word be opened up in your life. So the power in his name can be revealed in your life. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. 26 down. First Corinthians chapter 1 verses 26 down. For consider your calling, brethren. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify, say nullify, that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now this is God's express desire, his express interest. His express interest that no man may boast before him. Don't try to do PR work for God. I want you to know that this is, uh, this is my God. He will not allow man to boast. He will not share his glory with any man. No man may boast, meaning no man may boast. And if anyone boasts, let him boast in the? Let your boast be in the Lord. May morning, may in the morning, let, let it be in your life that in the morning, in the, in the noon, in the evening, in the night, every time of the day, every hour of the day, all you have to say is the mighty works, about the mighty works of God. God did this, God did that. Everyone who comes to your place, everyone who, who meets you, everyone who has a meeting with you, an encounter with you, they will only hear about what God has done. The only time you open your mouth is to speak forth what God has done in your life. Oh, how I wish our lives were like that, simplified. It's so simple. And today we are crying about this and, and cribbing about that and complaining and murmuring about everything else. All, all that you have to do is focus on who God is. Attribute to God. Acknowledge Him for who He is. I, the Lord is putting in my heart. Some of you may have made mistakes in your life. You may have committed things of terrible shame. And you probably are thinking that you'll never be able to come out of it. You think that probably you'll never be able to erase that. I want you to know that God is able to do things that nobody will even remember. They will not have the faintest memory of those things. When God reverses your situation, all that people can say is what God has done in your life. Your mistakes does not stand in the way of God doing a work in your life. His ways are beyond your ways. His ways are beyond your mistakes and your shortcomings and your foolishness. But you have to surrender and you submit and say, Lord, enough is enough. But I want to come into your presence. I want to stay where you are. And I want that thing to happen in my life according to your will. And be given to God. Be given to the glory of God. Everything that happens in my life from today on is for your glory. It's for your glory. For your glory alone, I lay my whole life, my whole life down before you. Verse 9, going back to the first Samuel chapter 2. He keeps the feet of his godly ones. I want you to take a good look at your feet. It's a terrible thing you, when, you, when you stumble and fall. It feels bad. It feels, it's a, even, for, even for kids, you know, I've, even for the kids, if they fall, it's, a, it's a, something that they don't, they don't like to remember that. They, they just want to like, they hope that nobody's watching them. They're hoping that nobody saw that. It's a, it's a very weird feeling. But the Bible says he keeps the feet of his godly ones. 
but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness for not by might shall a man prevail oh i'm now when i read this i can i just feel like going to sleep i just want to go and sleep i just feeling like taking a break and just just going just resting because it's not by might shall a man prevail it's not by might it's not by power it's by the spirit of god it's by the spirit of god it's the anointing in you amen that causes you to prevail over situations hallelujah those who contend with the lord will be shattered against them he will thunder in the heavens the lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and the horn and will exalt the horn of his anointed hallelujah he will exalt you know you we see that three times in the scripture three times we read that in this prayer he will exalt he will exalt he will exalt he will exalt the lord wants to assure you he will exalt he will exalt you in due to due time humble yourself under the mighty hand of god depend on the grace of god don't try to make room for yourself don't try to create anything for yourself wait on god wait on him wait silently on the lord amen wait upon him and he will exalt the horn of his anointed verse 11 says then elkana went to his home at rama but the boy ministered to the lord before eli the priest the boy what the bible does not say the boy played the boy like was was put in foster care the boy was it says the boy the boy ministered the boy ministered it says If Samuel the boy can minister how much more can you minister before the Lord that's God's heart for you his desire is to raise you up to lift you up it's not a small thing it's not a small thing that the Lord has hand picked you it's not a small thing that the Lord has lifted you up it's not a small thing that he has called you it's not a it's not a small thing that you are known as a servant of God it's not a small thing it's not a small thing you shall be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the lord and you shall be called the servants of the most high god and the work of your hands shall be established shall be established the work of your hand shall be established but you shall be minister a minister unto god you shall minister unto the lord you shall stand before god you shall go up to the altar of god you shall offer up sacrifice unto god you shall wear the ephod of god you shall stand and prophesy you shall declare the mighty deeds of god hallelujah you will forget the shame of yesterday the reproach of yesterday you shall not remember the lord will remove it far from you he he shall wipe every tear from your eyes he shall wipe away every tear if you can extract the precious from the vile he shall make you his spokesman a spokesperson hallelujah thank you jesus